Linda mentioned something in her prayer, and I failed to mention it before we went to prayer. Uh, Sunday Kylan came to me, and he said that, that he felt that he was being called to, uh, to some type of mission uh, activity, and most people would wait years before they did anything about that. He's going on his first mission trip tomorrow night, and he's going to the apartments in Rush Springs and having a Bible study with the small children that are living up there in those apartments. He already has his material ready. He's already prepared. Uh, he's already talked. We've, uh, the arrangements have already been made with management up there to allow him to do that and to meet with uh, the children that live in the apartment up there. And uh, so I want you to pray uh, for him as he goes and just shares. And I believe he's going to be sharing in, in, the, in uh, the book of Samuel. He's going to be talking about David and Goliath. And so I'm going to ask that you pray for him. He's right here. I thought he was still over there. There he is right here. And uh, pray for him tomorrow night as he, uh, as he goes and uh, shares God's Word. Uh, because that's what it's all about, folks, right there. That's what it's all about. If you got your Bibles with you tonight, let me invite you to open them to Revelation chapter 2. We'll begin at verse 18, and we're going to look at 18 through 29 tonight, and we're to the church of Thyatira. Now, we, have, we went to Ephesus, we went to Smyrna, and we went to Pergamos. And uh, now Pergamon was the farthest north of the churches, of the seven churches. Now we've made an arch, and we're going to come back down to Thyatira. One of the amazing things, I think, about, about the, the messages to the seven churches is that Thyatira, the city of Thyatira, <coughs> is the least significant of all these churches. Of all seven churches, it's the smallest, it's the least significant uh, of, of all the churches. As a matter of fact, Thyatira was an outpost. Uh, it was a, a city of protection for Pergamon or Pergamus. Uh, when the invading hordes would come from from, uh, from Asia over here, Asia Minor, when they would come down this way, sweeping across, Thyatira was the first that they got to, and it was kind of an outpost. It was a, an alarm system uh, for Pergamos. Thyatira has been destroyed more times than just about any, any Old Testament city. It's been destroyed. It's been rebuilt. It's been destroyed. It's been rebuilt. Uh, they had some trade guilds in Thyatira at this time. There was also one uh, very interesting thing about, about Thyatira. You remember in Acts, the, the lady named Lydia that was a, a merchant, a businesswoman. She was a seller of purple. Purple was the most expensive uh, dye uh, in this particular period of time. And it was, only, and it was made from the, from the roots there uh, of a plant that only grew uh, in Thyatira. And it was called a matter, a matter, M-A-D-D-E-R, a matter plant. And they would take that plant, the roots from that plant. But there was also a shellfish that was called a murex. And it's a little bitty shellfish. And one in each shellfish would produce one drop of this blue dye, just one drop. And a pound of this blue dry, dye was worth a 1,000 denarius. One pound of it was equal to a 1,000 days of wages, okay? So it was very expensive it was extremely expensive so we know from that that Lydia was a very wealthy woman uh, she was a merchant woman there from Thyatira so it did have it had a few things going for it but it but as far as the cities goes Laodicea Philadelphia Sardis Pergamos Smyrna and Ephesus and Thyatira it was the least significant of all of these cities but the amazing thing about it is the letter to the church at Thyatira happens to be the longest message to any of the churches. It was the least significant city, but it also had the longest letter to it. It has the longest message uh, of any of the cities. And so we're going to begin, and <clears throat> we're going to look in a little bit about uh, the, the message to Thyatira. So beginning in verse 18. To the angel of the church, you remember we talked about the angel of the church is the pastor of the churches there. That's, that's kind of on the physical part what it's talking about. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Now, each church is has an introduction from the Son of God. Each church is represented by the Son of God. If you remember Ephesus, uh, the introduction of Ephesus was to the one who walked, who held the, the seven angels and, and walked among the seven lampstands, okay? 
There's only one person that can hold all of history in his hand. There's only one person that can walk through all of history, which is what the seven churches represent. And we realize that that was none other than, than the Son of God. And so the introduction in Ephesus was about Jesus. The introduction to the church at Smyrna was the one who was the first and the last who died and who came back who came back to life. Well, there's only one person that has, that has died and came back to life and never died again. Now, in the Bible, people have been resurrected from the dead. Jesus resurrected Lazarus from the dead, but Lazarus died again. There's only one person that has died and been resurrected from the dead and has never died, and that's Jesus Christ. So we know that, that he was talking about Jesus Christ also in the introduction of Smyrna. The introduction to Pergamum is the words who, of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. We know that the, that the sword, the word of God, is, is, a, is as sharp as a two-edged sword. We know in the end of Revelation, in the, in the 19th chapter of the book of Revelation, when we get to the part of Jesus' second coming, that Jesus will, will destroy, he will defeat all the enemies on earth by the sword that proceeds out of his mouth, which is a two-edged sword. And we know that Jesus is the one that's talking about here. The message to Thyatira, it says, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and on whose feet are like burnished bronze. That is an introduction to judgment. Anytime, uh, in, also in Revelation chapter 19, when it talks about the second coming of Jesus Christ, when he comes again, the Bible's very specific. He will have eyes like a flame of fire. In the book of the Old Testament, when it talks about feet of, of bronze, of burnished bronze, in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel and in Daniel, he talks about the statue uh, with those feet, but it was feet of clay, and the feet of clay would melt. The feet of clay would crumble. The feet of burnished bronze are, are basically indestructible as far as that goes. So we know here that he's talking about judgment here because Jesus, when he comes back with eyes like a flame of fire, he's coming back with vengeance. He's coming back uh, in a time of judgment. So this letter to the church of Thyatira, even though it's the least significant of all the churches, He's, he's introducing uh, a very a warrior Messiah that's coming back. He's coming back uh, in judgment. So let's look at what he says to the church in Thyatira. He says, I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. Or in other words, your, your endurance to serve God even has exceeded your your, your love sometimes and your faith. He said, you hang in there. You're, you're hanging in there. You know, you're, you're, doing, you're doing that. He said in verse 20, he said, but I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. Now, when we mention Jezebel, we automatically go back to 1 Kings uh, to Ahab, who was the king of, of, of Israel, and his wife Jezebel, who was an evil woman who had brought in the worship of Baal uh, into, into the culture. And she had actually destroyed everything that the, the king was supposed to stand for God, was supposed to be a godly king. He wasn't. And Jezebel destroyed everything that, that he stood for. I, I get amused at what, and I, and I told the men this Sunday morning, but I get amused at what I heard Chris will preach on this passage of scripture one time and he said now remember he said he's talking to the angel at the church at Thyatira and that's the pastor and he's talking about Jezebel and he said you can read anything you want to in some commentaries and he said I read one commentary where it was talking about that that the angel at the church at Thyatira was the pastor that the pastor of the church's wife was Jezebel and she was going around behind the pastor destroying everything that the pastor was trying to do and he said what do y'all think about that and uh, then he realized what he had just said, and his wife was there. <laughs> and he said, he said, I'm going to retract that statement, and uh, we're going to move right on. But you can, you can read whatever you want to in it, but, but as you study God's Word, when Jezebel, every time Jezebel is mentioned in the Bible and even in Revelation, it is an evil system, okay? It's an evil worship practice. It is a, it's a system of, that's corrupt, that is taking everything away from God. It's a system that waters down God's Word. And basically, this is what he's saying. He said, I have this against you that you tolerate, that you tolerate the watering down, that you tolerate 
the compromising of God's word. I'm, I'm disappointed that you allow that, that you put up with that. And when, I, when, I, when we realize what he's talking about here, about the teaching and about, and about a, a message that is pleasing to people's ears, that practice sexual immorality, to eat food sacrificed to idols, or to offend their brothers and sisters in Christ, and, we, and he's allowing that. I think, you know, in our world today, in, in the United States of America, not just in the United States of America, but let's break it even down to the state of Oklahoma. When I look at and listen to uh, sometimes on TV, and that I, I look at pastors that are compromising God's word from the pulpit, they're preaching a, a sermon that's, that's watered down, that is preached to tickle people's ears because they don't want to offend anybody. They don't want to make anybody mad. And I think, you know, that's exactly what he's talking about here. When we, when we water down and compromise God's word, or when we just don't have church, and then I got to thinking about all the churches that don't have church. They don't have church on Sunday nights anymore. They don't have church on Wednesday nights anymore. You're hard-pressed in Oklahoma City to find a, a Baptist, Southern Baptist church that's having church on Sunday night. You'll be hard-pressed to find one that's having Wednesday night services. And in this area right here, within a 20-mile radius of this church right here, you're going to be hard-pressed to find a lot of churches. Some of them are not having church on Sunday nights. A lot of them aren't having church on Wednesday nights uh, during the summer because the kids aren't in school. And I think that's when you need to have it more than anything so that they can, they can still have a little bit of something about, about God. And when I think about all those practices that are going on, in fact, in, in God's Word, when it says that as the end of time, and I'm paraphrasing this, and I can't even quote the, the book, chapter, and verse this is. Somebody might can, can help me here. But basically, Paul says, as you see the end approaching, and I think we can see the end approaching, he says that we should speed up our service to God, that we should speed up our works. And what do we see happening? We see it slowing down. But, but it also says that in the end times, you're going to see a falling away from God. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And he's talking to the church of Thyatira here. He's saying, I know your works, that, that you've done good things, but he said, I've got this against you, that you're, you're tolerating this, this lack of worship around you and not speaking out against it. And this, this lack of, this lackadaisical attitude and this, this attitude that, well, that's okay. If this is how they feel like they want to live, or if this is how they feel like, you know, this is what they are, that's okay. Let's just, you know, let's just allow it. It's okay. 2016, you know, it's different than it was, you know, back in, in, in 100 A.D. Well, it's not, okay? God's Word's the same it, yesterday, today, and forever. It's the same thing. We're guilty of watering down God's Word. We're guilty of being passive. In, in a world and, and let a lot of these things happen. In verse 21 he says, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. And when he's talking about sexual immorality here, the Bible always refers to, you go back to the Old Testament when God talks about Israel committing adultery. Well, how does a nation commit adultery? Well, it's simple. A nation that was, that was belonged to God God views himself as the husband of Israel in the Old Testament and that Israel, as the wife, turned her back on God and ran after the worldly things and to God that was committing sexual immorality. And that's what the Bible is talking about here, that we as the church and, and the people that, can, that profess to be Christians have turned their back on God and God's using the, the, the harsh uh, warning here terminology and calling it sexual immorality which refers us back to what he was talking to Israel about, committing adultery in the Old Testament. And what did he do to them finally? When they didn't turn back to him, they didn't come back to him, what did he do? He punished them. He allowed them to be carried off into captivity. Well, the warning here to the church is that, hey, I gave you time to repent, but you refused to repent. And when we refuse to repent, something happens. He says, behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of their works. In 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter is where Paul talks about the Lord's Supper, I think. 
think that's right. And Paul warns the Christians before they, he said, a lot of you are sick and a lot of you sleep because you take of the Lord's Supper unworthily, of the Lord's table unworthily. You don't repent. You're not, you don't repent of the sin in your life. You're not, you're, you're, you don't, you're, don't humble yourself before God and ask for forgiveness before you come to the Lord's table. And because of that, he says, some of you are sick physically. He's talking about you're physically sick. And he said, even on top of that, some of you sleep. Some of you died because God had, would rather take you out of here, I think, and to leave you here as a bad example or a bad testimony. He's saying right here, and he's talking to the church here corporately. He's talking to people corporately. He says, I will throw her, her who? Her, the Jezebel, who is the, the, the worship practice that is compromising God's word, the worship practice that is, that is watering down God's word. He said, I'm going to throw them onto a sick bed. I'm going to make them physically sick. And those who commit adultery with her, I'm going to even throw, not only make them sick, I'm going to throw them into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. I'm going to take it one step farther corporately here. When this nation was incorporated, when those 55 men were in that upper room, there was one book on the table in front of them, and it was the Bible. And when they, when they drew up their constitution. They looked at a lot of different countries and, and they decided that a parliament, you know, a democracy, any, <coughs> all of these things, if they can give freedom, <coughs> they can take freedom away. And they used God's word. <coughs> they based it on God's word. We as a nation have turned away from God's word. I mean, that's a real apparent that we have turned away <coughs> from God's word. Get behind me, Satan. You're going to say this, <clears throat> whether you like it or not. So just go on. We as a nation have turned from God. We have slid backwards. Would you say that our nation is not in great tribulation, or would you say it is? I think it is. I think we are. And this, I think this is just a prophecy that we're seeing come true right now before our eyes that he says, I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works. What does First Chronicles 7, 14 say? If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then will I, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, I'll forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. In other words, I will take their land out of tribulation. I don't know why we cannot see as a, as a kingdom of God, as, as a Christian community as the church in the in America I don't know why we cannot see that all of this ties together that it's not just a bit here and a bit there but it all ties together and it's all God trying to show us that hey you need to repent corporately you need to repent individually you need to bring be brought back together it needs to all come back together to me and until you do that you're going to be in great tribulation until you do that you're going to see all manner of things happening. And until you repent of your works, of your evil works, you're still going to, you're going to have problems in this nation. It's going to be bad. He says, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart. And I will give to each of you according <clears throat> to your works. One of these days, the Christians are going to go to heaven, but we're going to stand before the beam of seat of Christ and we're going to receive our rewards according to our works. The evilness, the people without Christ, the followers of Satan that have bought into his lie, they're going to be judged according to their works too. It's a great throne judgment and they're going to be judged to their works and their works are going to come up short. And the Bible says that everyone whose name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life is going to be cast into the lake of fire. And so that's a true statement. We, we are going to be judged according to our works in one way or the other. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, and look what he says, who do not hold this teaching or who do not water down God's word, who do not compromise God's word, who, who stand on God's word, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned 
what some call the deep things of Satan. In other words, the ones that refuse to follow the evilness, that refuse to do anything but stand on God's word and preach God's word. He says, to you, he said, I do not lay on you any other burden, <clears throat> only any other burden. He said, I know your works and your love and your faith and service and patient endurance that the, your latter works exceed the first. This is the ones he's talking about there. He says, I don't rest, I don't lay any of this on you. I don't only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. When Jesus comes back in the second coming, the saints are going to come with him. Now, and we're not bragging when we say this, but we're saints. That's who the saints are, okay? It's going to be the church, the Christians that go. We're coming back with him. We're going to follow him. He's going to come first. We're going to be behind him because he's going to, he's going to win the war. He doesn't take nobody but him. He's going to do the fighting. We're not. And we're going to conquer with him. He's going to have a thousand-year millennial reign on the throne of David, the millennial temple in the city of Jerusalem right now. We are going to reign with him. Okay, and then even in the end, I think, I don't know what we'll be doing for all of eternity, but our God's a creating God, and I, I think that we're going to be placed in charge of things according to our, to our works and our, and our rewards and stuff like that. But he says, I will give him authority over the nations. We're going to have authority as God's, as the saints when we come back. God has a thing for us to do. He has a job for us to do. I don't think we're going to be floating around on a cloud playing a harp. I'm sorry. I just don't think we're going to do that. I, you see these pictures of floating around with these angel wings and playing a harp. I don't really think that's what we're going to be doing. Because uh, I can't find that in the Bible anywhere, but I can find where God says, I'm going to give you authority over nations. You're going to rule with me. Uh, and, and I think we're going to have something to do, okay? Because everything I see about God in the Bible, he's a busy God. He, he never, he's always working, okay? He's doing things. He says, uh, and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. And I will give him the morning star. The morning star is always referred to as Jesus Christ in God's word. In other words, that we were going to be with Jesus, one with him forever and ever. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. He ends every one of these letters in the same way. He who has an ear to hear, let him, let him hear what he says. The one who conquers and keeps my works. The one who conquers is the one that is the Christian that refuses to compromise, that refuses to, to water down, that refuses to compromise God's work. And it's my hope and it's my prayer that the people at Vimy Ridge will always stand firmly on God's word, that the people at Vimy Ridge will never compromise God's word, no matter, no matter what the cost, that we would never water down God's word to please people that come out here to church. Because if, if we're preaching a gospel just to please and tickle people's ears, that's wrong. Because we need to preach the, the, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, the whole word of God. And that's what we will do at Vimy Ridge, no matter what the cost is. And God has a promise for those that will. And that's his promise. And that's the promise that we're going to claim as a church. That's the promise I'm going to claim as the pastor of this church, and I hope it's the promise that you claim as a, as a member of this church and a, and a soldier of the cross of Christ. Because it's not about us, it's not about Vine Ridge, it's not about the pastor, it's about Jesus. It's always about Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, to him be the honor, to him be the glory. Let's pray.